Yeah, Camila, you can give it a start. Hello to everybody. Uh, in some part of the world, good, af uh, good afternoon, and uh, in the others, good morning. Uh, welcome to the ELTA webinar. My name is Kamila Kurkowska and I'm the ambassador of ELTA uh, in Poland. Uh, today we will talk about the legal tech media and how to get exposure, international exposure of the legal tech startups. Uh, I invited today a uh, great, I would say, legal tech uh, personalities. Uh, it will be Janet Huerta from uh, Foro Jurídico from uh, Mexico, uh, Caroline Hill, Editor-in-Chief of Legal IT Insider, uh, Vanita Thin uh, from Kyra Systems, Bob Ambrogi, uh, Editor-in-Chief from Law Sites Blog, uh, Richard Tromans from Artif Artificial Lawyer, and uh, Alejandro Esteve de Miguel uh, from um, Beagle Legal. One, uh, one issue that I was asked to, to say that we will record this webinar and it will be published tomorrow um, on our uh, YouTube, uh, YouTube channel. So uh, once again, uh, hello to, uh, to our speakers. It's so nice to, uh, so nice to, uh, to have you here. Uh, let's assume that I'm a co-founder of the Legal Tech Startup. Uh, we just finished uh, version one uh, one zero of our product, and uh, right now we are ready to the rollout, to the international rollout of uh, of our our product. Uh, how should we reach the the legal tech uh, media? What should do the the legal tech provider or legal tech startups uh, startup to get mentioned into the legal tech media? What kind of stories uh, do you do you publish? Janet, could you please start? Thank you. Hi, and it's a pleasure to, to be able to share with you. Well, I'm here between, uh, between many giants of the, of the legal tech media, and I got the, the, the luck to get to be the one to start. Uh, but well, I'm here representing a little bit like the Latin American perspective. I'm from Mexico. Uh, I represent uh, a, a couple of, of media, and we started last year specializing in legal tech because, well, definitely in in Latin America, we're we're starting to develop this legal tech ecosystem. But you can be a startup, you can have a fabulous project, uh, product, project, and if nobody knows you, well, definitely nobody is going to use this product. No, so. What we started doing um, is uh, different initiatives to, to give diffusion to these legal texts. So first of all, what I would say you would do is definitely you have to be proactive and contact directly the media. I've received a lot of, of, of direct contacts through LinkedIn. LinkedIn is a really, a really uh, good, um, well, social media no sometimes it's not directly through email but through linkedin where we make this contact with the legal text and um, so it's definitely having first of all persistence and second of all uh being able to just go ahead and contact directly the, the media now that has worked a lot for me and i say persistence because sometimes we when, when we didn't have like a specific strategy, we used to have a lot of requests and probably didn't give uh, access to all of them, no? So maybe the people that wrote to us twice or three times or four times were the ones that at the end got, got the attention, no? And I would say definitely um, it's important for us to generate good content. For us as a media, especially in Mexico and Latin America, it's not only about saying this is the legal tech companies that, that, that are in the market, but it's also about educating the market, no? The users maybe don't even know in Mexico what is a marketplace, a, a, a legal marketplace, or how can they use it, no? We've seen a couple of legal techs in Mexico, which not only have their solutions, but have had to put like a sort of uh, legal tech consultancy, of, because in, in Mexico, what we see 
is that many times uh, lawyers, even in companies or, or in-house or, or, um, or law, law firms, the, the ones that are not international, the ones that are more medium-sized, don't necessarily even have, their, their process is clear to know where or how they can implement a legal tech, uh, a, a technological solution, no? So we have to help them like three or four steps previously to selling them a solution. So basically, um, what, what I would say and recommend also, it's, it's we bring in the stories that not only want to sell a legal tech solution, but that are willing to help us prepare the market to understand the benefits of using a legal tech solution and also of constructing inside all the, the steps you need as a company, uh, the, the law firms or the, or the in-house in order to use this legal tech. No? And second of all, it's also, also I think the market, um, from what we've seen, we don't only generate content in our magazine, but we also have uh, uh, webinars that are being very successful. We have each, each week uh, a webinar where we have 200, 300 people um, signing in. And we bring these legal tech solutions so that people can see them because it's also that lawyers can see them in action. No, so basically we started not only advertising, not only telling a story, but also doing it in video so lawyers can, can go and see how, it, how the solution looks no? And we can explain to them in live and they can ask in live. So basically these webinars have been very, um, very successful because people get to interact. No? And we don't only talk about, for example, a case, uh, a case tracking tool, but we talk about how you, how you manage a case and how you track a case and how legal tech can, can use you, can, can serve you for this uh, task. No? So, so I understand that there is a lot of educational uh, part of, uh, of your materials. Totally. And that's where we make alliances with legal techs who can not only uh, talk about their solution, but talk about like the topic in general. So we can bring content to the market. No? Okay. Uh, thank you. Before the webinar, we were talking with Janet that maybe the CEE market is quite similar to the, uh, to the market in uh, Latin America, but let's come back to uh, to Europe, but to the uh, I would say uh, far more ma mature market. Caroline, how it is in the UK? Yes, hi there. Thank you very much for having me too. It's a great pleasure to be here today. Um, yeah, so my uh, publication, Legal IT Insider, has been going for 25 years. And um, so we don't just focus on new tech; we focus on all tech for our, for our sin. So and globally. Um, so we cover, cover all markets um, and I would say that um, so I guess it's the same for startups as with any kind of business reach out so um, it's um, you know, I would say that uh, it's about per being personable that there's, there's many different things all, that you need to tick I would say tick the box you need to be I think one of these things are about trying to form relations so so I, initially I think emails are the best way in terms of just the delivery mechanism which is a tough sell because obviously all of us on this call will get a thousand emails um, and I'm guilty of missing communication so perhaps a multi multi-track like like Janet was saying you know perhaps using social media as well to try to get our attention but remembering that you know we're, we're all people and that um, sometimes um, the personable you know being as personable and authentic as possible because I, I get um, you know a lot of reach out so where something jumps out, where someone's really trying to, you know, perhaps you know, we, we can help sometimes on the journey. You know, it's really great to be part of that journey. If um, you know, to, if people want advice, or we, we don't, we're not suggesting we have all the time in the world, but sometimes just trying to explain what position they are in, you know, trying to help bring us along on the journey sometimes can be helpful. Um, but but I think that um, there are a few things that I think that startups don't tend off sometimes to do. Oh, the doors can go. Oh, sorry, uh, there's a few things that <laughs> we talked about this off air. There's a few things that startups often don't, I think, do, which I'd like to share in this segment. And one is that they, they they need to kind of explain as quickly as possible what you know what what they are, what they do, where they fit in, right? I know that's a really sort of easy easier said than done thing. But I think that some startups are very sort of 
um, they're very passionate about what they do, but sometimes don't communicate to, to, the, to somebody who's trying to understand very quickly. They don't necessarily talk about where they fit in terms of the competition, which sometimes is an easy way to explain, you know, right, this is where I fit. To try to immediately, I can go, right, <laughs> you don't want to talk about your competitors, but it helps me understand where you fit in, right? So understand the market and show that you understand the market and explain where you fit in the market. Understand, perhaps, I think one of the other things that I don't always see is startups don't always um, sometimes explain what the problem is that they're solving. I think that that's where everything should start. So the client has a problem. What is the problem that you're trying to fix? If you can start with that and say, right, this is the this is this is my client. These are the problems that I'm fixing, and work backwards from there. And this is the problem I fix. So then I can, because we have a very good knowledge of law firms, obviously. So I can go, oh, okay. So or whether it be the corporate market, right? So I can understand. Like again, it's that context, right? So I can understand what it is that they're trying to fix, and that's a really important thing I think to for startups to understand the market in which you operate. And sometimes when I meet startups at incubators, sometimes I say, oh, you know. Have you, have you looked at this or look at, looked at that? And they don't, sometimes haven't made, made themselves, and I don't mean to sound patronizing, so apologies if it comes across that way, but haven't made themselves aware of the comp competition or how, how they fit in. I think that's absolutely crucial. Um, and then, um, and then, and also top, top, be topical. So, so for example, we're in the COVID era, can't escape talking about COVID. It's very tough for startups, we know. So, so why? you know, um, what in it, so be, make it topical, whether it be now, because you say, right, I'm in this particular segment of the market, which all of my clients are going to need to, they're going to need me to fix this particular problem, right? We know that, for example, law firms are very much cutting their IT spend, they're, they're, they're not really looking at innovation for innovation's sake, um, and they're very much being cautious. Why, so, so, so why, you know, why now? What, so not, not just, you know, it doesn't have to be COVID, but whatever period you're reaching out at, hopefully we'll get beyond COVID at some point. Why, why is it relevant? What's the topical? Can you make it as topical as possible so that it gives us something to latch onto? You know, so that we can say, oh, right, well, I'm writing about this, so this helps us fit in. Um, and, then, um, and then in terms of, like, the amount of contact, um, I think, um, like, contact when there is an update like obviously we have relationships with people and love to chat with some people you know and if you've got that kind of relationship it's easy to pick up the phone but where you don't have that make it make it punchy you know like so so make it so that there is an update um and that there is something that we can talk about and i think those are my sort of like top tips as it were off, off the bat cool thank you uh bob one question to uh, to you what is the easiest way to uh, to get in touch with you and the second question would be, what kind of news do you like to publish uh, into your blog or your social media? Uh, because I would say that you are uh, somewhat like a trendsetter uh, in, uh, in this sector. So uh, I believe that a lot of our attendees would be uh, really interested in, uh, in your point of view. Uh, well, uh, yeah, good, good day, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, and uh, from the United States. And thank you for having me as, as part of this. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, so I, my blog, uh, Law Sites, I, I cover uh, legal technology, innovation in law. Uh, I've been doing that blog for a long time. I think it's 18 years I've been doing that. Uh, and I also write a, a technology column for Above the Law, uh, the Above the Law blog. And I, I do a podcast called Law Next, where we, we tend to focus on innovation uh, in law. I do a lot of interviews there with founders of, of legal tech startups uh, and uh, actually have another podcast with Caroline Hill, who uh, was just speaking uh, every Friday we get together and do kind of a legal tech media uh, roundup of, of the news, new week's news stories. Um, so I, I'm really interested in a, in a broad array of news, especially from startups. I, I always love hearing from uh, new legal tech startups. Uh, I have a, a section of my blog on my website where I try and keep a list of all the legal tech startups. It's 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 woefully incomplete, uh, I'm sure, but uh, it should be a really have, long list. I would, <laughs> I, it's still I would quite long. I, I try and maintain a, it's basically a database of, of legal tech startups. So if nothing else, uh, a company should just re shoot me an email uh, and let me know that they exist. Um, and, uh, you know, the best way to reach me is just by email, which is uh, my last name, ambrogi at gmail.com. Uh, I, uh, 
I, I think I think it was Janet who said she likes LinkedIn. I hate LinkedIn. <laughs> uh, I, I, and I, I'm not I'm really sure why. LinkedIn. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I don't really hate it. I just part of the problem is I've just got. I'm sure a lot of the people on this call. I have people approaching me through so many different media. You know, people tweeting at me and and messaging me on Facebook and messaging me on LinkedIn, uh, and. It's certainly easier for me if I can keep it all in one place. So I'd prefer an email, but whatever. I do check those other those other sources as well. And uh, you know, I, I mean, I I don't know that I have that much to add to what's what's already been said. Other than uh, I would also repeat something else Jan Janet said, and I think Caroline said the same thing, which is if if you message me and I don't respond. Uh, Try try again because I really do get just tons and tons of email and things get lost very easily in in my inbox and uh, uh, sometimes the squeaky wheel does get the grease uh, in terms of getting noticed. Um, also, you know, if you're going to pitch me to write about your startup, uh, tell me tell me why tell me why I want to write about it. I mean, tell me what you're doing, what problem you're solving, what what's what's unique about you, what's different about you, uh, and 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 do your homework. Uh, and by that I mean, you know, don't make make sure you've kind of looked around at what else is going on in the market uh, and where you fit in the market. Don't tell me that you're the first company to do such and such when 10 other companies are already doing it and you were just too lazy to go out and do the research. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, just uh, tell me, uh, tell me why, uh, why you're, what you're doing is interesting and unique and, and why I should write about you. Um, but, but generally, I'm really interested in, in hearing uh, from as many companies as I can and, and uh, uh, happy to uh, happy to talk and 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 uh, chat about what you're up to. So uh, feel free to reach out to me. I'm also on Twitter at, at Bob Ambrogi. Okay, thank you, uh, Richard. We will come back to Europe. Uh, the question for you, uh, as as to every uh, as to everybody, what is the best way to contact you? But I would also uh, I would like also to ask you. Uh, I would say as a uh, representative of the CEE region, uh, because you write a lot of uh, a lot of what is happening in in UK uh, in the states. Are you also interested into um, into the other markets? I mean, uh, I uh, I suppose that from the UK perspective, uh, Polish market or Hungarian market it's uh, quite exotic, uh, but uh, um, there are any chance to uh, to be published the uh, the news from the uh, from our part of Europe or uh, or from the continental Europe? I would say. Okay, I'll I'll unpack that a bit. So first of all, I think as other people have said, email is the best. That there are so many different ways of reaching people these days. Uh, email is the best. The reason why is because then you've got like an historical log, and you can always go back and search for it. So email's best. Uh, if people do contact me on LinkedIn, I'll move them onto email as soon as I can. Um, in terms of getting noticed, in terms of getting written about, sort of building on the point about relationships, I think from a distance, all legal tech looks the same. You know, all legal tech media, I should say, looks the same. But we are all quite different. I mean, even if you don't realize it, I mean, you know, Artificial Lawyer is different to other magazines and so forth. We all have our own particular things that we're interested in. So I would say, to some degree, the right startups pair up with the right media. Uh, you, it don't, I don't really care where a company comes from. I mean, I've been writing about European, South American, Japanese, Chinese startups and companies for since I started if, about four years ago. Um, what matters is, do you connect with that journalist? It goes back to the relationship points. Okay. You know, I mean, artificial lawyer, if, if, I mean, basically, if you want me to be interested in what you do, you know, you should be interested and understand what I'm trying to do. So okay. if you haven't read artificial lawyer very much, if you don't know what it is I'm always banging on about, and I'm not too kind of secret about my views, I'm sort of fairly open. So it's kind of obvious what I think. Um, 
if you tune into those views yourself, if you believe in what I'm trying to do in the project, what I'm trying to build effectively, um, then I will probably write about you, you know, and you don't have to be some whizzy AI company, it, you know, I mean, some of the companies I write about are sort of docu automation, which is a very old technology, but they're taking a sort of more modern approach. Uh, they're interested in access to justice. They're actually interested in changing the business of law. And if they come at me with those themes, it's so much more likely I'm going to write about them. Just saying like, I'm just this generic, I don't know, document management system. I have no particular interest in anything. Can you just write about this thing that I've made? It's probably going to fall down the back of the sofa. You know, okay. it's just not going to get written about. So um, email, build relationships, do on a personal level, you know, uh, I mean, you know, we're all just people try and try and hit us in, in our hearts, you know, get, what are we passionate about? Um, age to age business. Yeah, I mean, you know, what do we actually really care about? Uh, I'll be honest, I don't want all legal tech companies to contact me. I really don't. Uh, all, all law firms. Um, because that's not what artificial lawyer is about. It's, I mean, the, the purpose of artificial lawyer is to have a sort of particular slant on things. Um, so I would say, and I'm not even going to tell people, you know, <laughs> do some legwork, as Bob said, do some homework, find out what it is artificial lawyer is about. And if you think you're a good fit, please email me. Yeah, it's very interesting uh, what you are uh, talking about, because, for example, here in Poland, artificial lawyer, lawyer, uh, lawyer is something like a very important um, point of reference. But uh, a lot of lawyers, they say, no, but uh, what is written here uh, is, um, is only, you know, valid into the UK market or US market, and our market is different that uh, I'm fundamentally, in, uh, I don't agree with, with that, but um, we, uh, we have here this, uh, this, kind of, uh, this kind of opinions. I invited yeah. to, sorry. Uh, I was please. gonna say, it's, no, it's an interesting point. I mean, the truth is, right, that aside from the US, the UK, maybe Singapore, Australia, Canada, and a couple of those parts of Germany, a small part of Paris, um, you know, a lot of the market is a few years behind. But in every market, you'll find people who are trying to push, push things forward and change things. So, I mean, look at Scandinavia. There's some great companies coming out of there. Uh, but the legal market itself is very conservative. But you've got little bubbles of activity. So, you know, um, I'm kind of optimistic. I'm, I'm, you know, legal tech knows no borders. Thank you. Uh, I invited to you to uh, for our webinar also the uh, the representatives uh, of the legal tech uh, startups and uh, and providers to have somehow uh, both side uh, perspective. Uh, Vanita, could you share with us? Uh, do you have any uh, strategical approach uh, to be present into the legal tech media? Hi everyone, it's a pleasure to be here. So for background, I manage Kira Systems PR and social media program. So my perspective is that of a communications professional. Um, so when the company was first founded, our CEO Noah Weisberg was heavily invested in brand awareness. He wrote blog posts on legal tech issues, shared his insights on social media. He engaged with influencers by commenting on their work also known as the read and react approach. Um, in fact, by doing this and by engaging with them, he built relationships that then helped him with securing in speaking engagements at conferences like reInvent Law and ILTA. And it also helped with securing media coverage and the momentum just continued from there. So I would say that a key learning here is to position yourself as an authority in the space by creating original and educational content and then sharing these insights with the legal tech community where you can. So this will be important for you as you establish your new business um, and also because in-house resources will be limited and I recognize that so it's important that you leverage what you can and that entails your own media platforms. So the other side of this is identifying the niche influencers, journalists, thought leaders, um, online contributors 
who speak to your target audiences, and then forming relationships with them. By doing this, you'll get your brand recognized and you'll start getting noticed as more of a major player or a thought leader, especially if you're consistent with marketing yourself. So that's essentially how Kira Systems went about building its brand. But the other side of that is as Kira Systems grew, leadership decided to invest in an in-house NPR um, marketing team to help take that brand recognition to another level. So they recognized the power of storytelling and the role that PR plays in brand awareness itself. So to expand on this, I think now successful marketing and communication teams are moving away from the big quarterly campaigns and more to a model of publishing frequently and daily. So that means being present with engaging and educational content that adds value to your audience's journey. So in terms of what that looks like, it's mini campaigns, it's engaging visuals that break through that scrolling stream. And probably the most important piece here is big rock content initiatives, such as original research and data. So I, everyone, every single person that I have met values research and data-driven insights, including prospects, customers, and journalists. And for us, we create these big rock content initiatives by leveraging Kira, our own software to bring you insights to market that are relevant to the topics of today, which is a key point um, that Caroline brought up. And as an example, we recently launched a study um, on force majeure and what commercial contracts say about the provision. And because um, the topic was being widely discussed among journalists and clients, we were able to gain traction from it. And after launching the study, we used specific data points and shared those insights um, with different target audiences. So we cut it into digestible pieces to be relevant to a specific audience. And then I myself pitched the study to journalists um, and different target audiences. And I was able to secure coverage and many outlets. And then on the other side, we have our clients citing our research in their own websites, on their own blog posts, so that they can keep relevant. So I think in the end, there's something in it for everyone. And at the same time, we're reinforcing our product value proposition and the content and insights we're bringing to the market. And then the other side of this is I also manage the company's blog program. And I make it my responsibility to interview our clients and understand how they're leveraging Kira um, to help them navigate the pandemic. And through those learnings and what insights they provide to me, I then share that with journalists and it also helps me with securing coverage. Um, so that's essentially what has worked for me in 2020. Thank you. You, uh, Vanita, you are also the, you are the person who is responsible for the, uh, for the PR in Kaira systems. How yes. do you measure the effectiveness of PR activities? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so <laughs> I know that <laughs> that's a really difficult question. I realize of it. <laughs> it's, it's difficult, but a good question and very important. So I measure effectiveness by developing strategies and creating reports to quantify impact in a way that colleagues and other stakeholders will easily understand. Um, basically, strategic planning is a critical first step towards achieving success across all areas of business. And it's really important in PR because it's difficult to prove ROI in the traditional sense. And with the strategic plan, you can ensure that there's a shared understanding of what you're trying to achieve, how you plan to do it, and how you're going to measure success. So, start, um, so based on that, what you should do is understand the core foundations of a PR plan for a legal tech startup. What that entails is goals, objectives, strategies, and tactics. And then pay close attention to your objectives. I cannot stress this enough. These are the subsets of goals 
and should be expressed in like very concrete, measurable terms. So for example, um, if I'm launching a new product to market, my one of my object objectives could be to secure five articles with the legal tech publications for launch day, right? It's very measurable and I can then understand if I met that goal. Um, and then to proactively measure influence across the media ecosystem, I create reports and include a short list of metrics as well as benchmarks um, or historical comparisons to showcase how current results compared to previous months or previous campaigns. So this is something that I found online, but I think it summarizes this in a very um, memorable way. A powerful PR plan is a roadmap with a goal as the destination and objectives as the mileposts and bridges you need to cross to get there. The strategies are the methods you will use to travel and tactics are the fuel moving you along. By building it this way, you ground your plan in specifics and metrics and better measure effectiveness of your media relation activity. So I, I think there could be another webinar on <laughs> key <laughs> metrics to include. So I could we will think about that. that. <laughs> we will think about that. Thank you. Uh, Alejandro, last, last but not least, uh, could you pl please uh, tell us about your approach to the uh, PR, to the to your presence into the into the media? Okay, uh, thank you, thank you very much for for having me, Camila. I think from 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 our point of view, we are we are a legal tech startup. We are a document automation software uh, powered by AI. Um, I think what we have uh, what we live. Uh, uh, inside a startup is we remain at war all the time. We are all the time at stress. We need to do incredible results in a very short amount of time. And uh, I think this is one of the main problems that people start to, okay, I need to get attention from media. I need to go out there. I have a, an amazing product and I, I need to knock on the door of this and that blog so that it can be published. And this will uh, impact uh, uh, enormously in my growth. But sometimes what they don't understand is that you need to invest a lot of time. You already said that. It takes time. And you need to build, uh, you need to build, I think, trust. Because otherwise what you're doing is just, uh, you're shooting to the air to see if some, someone, there is a bear that was uh, laying around. But I, what I would suggest for startups is, is to try. You need to try it, but what you need to do is to focus. If you want to try it, try it hard. You, you, you really have to invest in it. Otherwise, mm, at, at the beginning, you, you, at least if you have a small team, you can do two or three things good, but you cannot do 10 things good. So you either have a good product or you have a good marketing, but you cannot do everything good customer success, good product, good everything. It's not possible. We're humans, right? So our approach in this sense, at the beginning we got a lot of coverage, at least in, in our region. Uh, it's because I think we started very early on in 2013, 2014, but uh, we didn't have a, a, quite a, a lot of good results. And I think it's because our, I am a lawyer as well, but I think our colleagues, they were afraid they didn't understand what legal tech was, and they were threatened by the fact that, oh, there's a new players here in the market, and they're going to get rid of us. So this is what we experienced in the first years of Big Illegal. And then gradually, what, we, what we, we've done is um, to focus more on other aspects of the, of the business. And we, when we had uh, media coverage, I think it was because, let's say, um, we deserved it because there was something that needed to be in the news, not because we were just shooting PR like crazy to see if we catch uh, uh, a fish. Um, I think there should be a strategy, there should be focus, but on the other hand, depending on the size of the startup and at the stage the startup is, I think it's not the most important thing. I think the startup needs to build trust with the market, but not necessarily needs to go directly to the press. 
I think it needs to go directly to the client first. So the best way to earn trust is to have clients. Okay. Uh, thank you. You, um, um, you have told about, uh, about the uh, reduced resources. Do you have right now any, uh, any person who is dedicated uh, to, to PR? And the second question, the same question that, uh, that I've made to Vanita, uh, do you measure somehow your PR activities? We, we do have a marketing team and we do not, we do not have one person dedicated full time to this, but definitely we invest some time there. I know that in the near future we will have, uh, of, of course, one position because I understand that at one point when you are doing many things at the same time, you're opening new markets, etc. It's very important. So I think that was a, a little bit what I was trying to, 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 to say to startups, depending on the state you are, it will, it will come to you. So you will have the resources to invest in someone that will take care of this part of your business. But maybe it's not the, the, the best thing to invest all your money at the beginning. Okay. And about measuring, uh, we do measure, and, and, and that's, uh, I think there, there, was, there was a, a very good book that we, uh, we wrote uh, uh, at the beginning, that you need to have a, a strategy, you need to test it, and then if it doesn't work, you need to go to the next one. Uh, and we do test it, not necessarily uh, uh, in numbers. I mean, for sure, there's many ways you can test it. Uh, if you test the amount of traffic that it gets uh, when there's a publication and you know f what's the source. So there's many ways you can do this. But uh, sometimes uh, it's not that kind of impact what you want. What you want is, for example, to build trust in another market. So you are new to the market and maybe there is, I don't know, if I go to Mexico, I will for sure knock on the door of Janet and say, hello, I'm here. I do have this background, these clients, and I have this uh, nice product, help me out. Then it would make sense. And for me, uh, although it may be some things I could not measure them, but I would have the sense that this would have benefit that me in a way or not. Okay, thank you. Richard, one question for you. Uh, I would like uh, to ask you about exclusivity versus broad, uh, broad distribution of the, uh, of the newses. What do you prefer? And what should uh, the legal tech startups do? We, can hear, we can't hear you. So I just I just told you my ultimate secret, but luckily it was on mute. That was okay. Um, <laughs> so yeah, you missed that bit. The um, so the, the stuff that I'm allowed to tell you is that I mean, journalists obviously want an exclusive, but personally, I mean, I, I mean, I'm you know, all of the journalists here probably feel the same way. <sighs> Making journalists kind of compete for a press release is just kind of it, it happens it happens on a weekly basis but it's not a great experience for anybody okay I, I would just simply say build relationships with the magazines and journalists who you think understand what you're trying to do and vice versa um, and work with them uh, and then work with everyone else you know if you want to but the problem is if you start doing exclusives to certain papers you end up annoying the others. And, and, and to some degree, it kind of shows like a lack of sophistication because it is about relationships. You know, I mean, I'm, you know, like, when, like someone will say something like, I don't know, we're announcing something, but we're going to announce it first in Bloomberg Law. And then we'll give it to you like five minutes before and you can try and write it really, really, really fast. You know, and you're just like, really? Is that, is that how we're going to do things? You know, it's... I don't think there's any good answer personally. Uh, I would just say that if you've got to the point where you're kind of playing, you know, chess with the journalists, you've, you've probably failed. Okay. Uh, you've, gone in, you've gone in the wrong direction. Uh, I say build a relationship with the papers that you care about, 
and then don't worry about everything else because they're reporting on you and it's going to the audience that you care about. You know, it, it all kind of mutually links together. And because it's the audience that cares about your product, they're likely to turn into interesting prospects for your, for your sales pipeline. Because ultimately, why else are you sending press releases? You're not doing it just for the fun of it. So I'd say it's all about build relationships, pick the magazines you want to work with, and then just work with them. It doesn't have to be one, it could be multiple. But don't get into this game of like, you know, sort of strategically giving someone an exclusive one week and then someone another. It just personally just annoys me. Even when people do it with me, I'm just like, oh, bugger it. You know, they've given me the exclusive. Now I know that everyone else will be annoyed. You know, that okay. it's, I don't think it's a good strategy personally. Okay. Thank you. Caroline, do you have anything to add? Yeah, so I take quite a different approach. To that. <laughs> so I quite like, we, I like, I, mean, I understand. I mean, we, um, you know, I get that it can be really annoying, but I think the nature of journalism personally, it's, you know, we, 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 do, we I like exclusives um, and um, sort of in this day of very quick news, um, obviously um, I'm actually terrible at social media. I'm going to be honest with you. Like I am often the quickest to put it up on our site and the absolute slowest to put it on LinkedIn, which is often, let's face it, where it counts. <laughs> so sometimes I just shoot myself in the foot anyway. But, but um, I think that, you know, for me personally, it does, you know, if I've got, we obviously have, um, we, we perhaps are um, broader in the coverage that, that we, we get. So um, there is some overlap with the, you know, quite a bit of overlap, that, you know, we also write, because there's a very broad range of stuff that we write about. Sometimes it, it won't necessarily compete with people. I mean, I suppose we're still talking about startups. So specifically, um, so I suppose, you know, it'd be quite annoying if one of the startups was to give us an exclusive. And maybe when you're starting out, actually thinking of it very much with the perspective of a startup, probably when you're starting out, it would be a bad idea to go down the exclusive route, potentially, because I guess when you're trying to build relationships with lots of people, so being, being selfless, I think probably you'd be trying to, you know, not shoot yourself in the foot. So probably Richard's advice is right. You know, when you're particularly starting out, you want to be building bridges with everybody potentially. You know, you want to be trying to sort of forge different relationships. And I think, you know, so that that's right when you're starting out. I think I think as you as you get more, you know, we deal with obviously a lot of the biggest um, legal tech organisations um, have long-standing relationships, and there are certain areas that we're probably more known for covering. You know, perhaps when it comes to practice management systems or case management systems or new this or new that or cloud, whatever it might be. Um, and they, so then, you know, we would be quite, you know, happy to get an exclusive, but I think that this, that this sector of the market, I think is absolutely right, you know, make friends. Um, but I just wanted, if I could just say one thing about, so picking up on the point that Benita made about, um, I think if you don't, do you mind if I pick up on something that Benita said? Yeah, about? of course. So, Go yeah, ahead. Probably, so I didn't know whether to jump in, but so Noah, um, really good at building brand actually and I think that um, so so um, sorry I know this probably disrupts your flow I, I won't keep doing this but I just wanted to observe so building your brand is so so what Noah used to do Noah used to go to still does probably but we're obviously in the COVID era we'd go to a legal geek or wherever it might be and go up on stage and do some crazy stunts right like he would make avocado toast on stage or whatever it was he did you know and um and he would build so so in conjunction with writing, he built he built a brand. Um, I don't know if Noah was listening, <laughs> um, and he would do some crazy stunts which were relevant, and he would capture the attention. Um, and I think if you can do that, if you can, I mean, he's quite stands out. You know, there's not an awful lot of people that would do that. Could probably can do that. Build building your brand, you know, particularly when there's events and you can get on stage, is a is a really good you know way to do that. Um, so I think. So I just wanted to jump in, Vinita. I really like <laughs> liked your points about how to get attention. Um, I think that you know, if you can make yourself stand out and people take notice of you outside of the direct attempts that you're making to get hold of us, it's, you know, just in, gen in the general sector, if you're trying to, you can build your brand, and that's quite helpful as well. Okay, thank you. Cool, uh, Bob. Uh, you work with with Caroline uh, with the uh, with the podcast. Uh, are you agree more with Caroline or with Richard, or you have totally, uh, let's say, in between? Well, I I, I agree with both of them <laughs> uh, somehow. Uh, you know, I mean, there's there's two sets of interests here. There, there's there's sort of my interest as as a publisher, and there's 
the interest of the company. Uh, certainly, as, as a publisher, I love to have an exclusive uh, because uh, it's going to drive up my readership. Uh, it's going to drive up my stats, and, and, and uh, that that's all good stuff. Uh, but I, you know, I, I think that Richard really is making the the correct point, which is you're you're really walking uh, along a, a kind of a very uh, narrow tightrope when you when you start to play this game. Uh, because uh, then you do start to risk um, uh, alienating or angering some other media outlet that you didn't give the exclusive to. Uh, and uh, I think what I've seen is that some PR people start to play this exclusive thing to their advantage, or they think to their advantage, in the sense that they will say, uh, you know, they're, they're, they will promise you some great exclusive and it turns out to be a Fine. dud. It turns out to not, it turns out to be something you probably wouldn't have covered otherwise if they hadn't given it to you uh, as, as an exclusive. Uh, and, and they use that to their advantage. Uh, and, and that only further, further angers you. Um, and, and then, you know, I, I think the other side of this is that, um, if you're going to, if you are going to, as a PR person, play that game where you're going to try and give something one-on-one -on -one to a particular journal, journalist or a particular publication, uh, then you have to play it also when the news isn't good. <laughs> and by that, I mean, sometimes I'll have PR people who are all too happy to talk to me when they've got some great exclusive that they want me to publish, which is usually good news. But then when there might be some bad news about their company that I'm calling them about, suddenly they don't take my calls or respond to me uh, and, and don't want to have uh, anything to do with me. Uh, so, you know, it, it So we I, come I, back I, once again to the relation. Uh, it's, uh, rela so it's all about relationships. I, the one other thing I will say, though, is that uh, in another point Richard made, I think, much earlier in this uh, program was the fact that we are all of our publications are different in some way, uh, and you need to know the publication. So I think there is probably a place for the exclusive when it really fits best with a particular publication where that audience is exactly the right audience that you wanna be reaching. Uh, and that's probably the time to do it. Uh, uh, and uh, in that case, uh, you know, I, I think go ahead and do it uh, and, and uh, Again, from my point of view, I will always, uh, always gladly accept your, your exclusives, but uh, it, it, from your own strategic point of view, it may not always be the best move. And actually, Bob, Bob and I, I think this was the first, so Bob and I had um, a mutual exclusive, didn't we? For someone, so, someone sent it to us the other day. Dear Bob and Caroline, here's your, here's your exclusive. <laughs> Like, just yeah, like, like what? <laughs> they just, just like, just like lumped us together, which was actually quite funny. And we, they were like, we, we like you both very much. And uh, <laughs> we were like, oh, hey, hey, Bob. <laughs> we know, right. thanks, thanks to our panel, we're like, we are one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Janet, uh, what is your opinion in this subject? Well, um, I would be more in the sort of Bob perspective, which I think. I think each media has the, its own audience, no? So really as a, as a legal tech, probably it is not a, the best, depends on the strategy, but you have to get to know the media and get to know the media's audience, no? So um, we in Foro Jurídico, we've, we've uh, chosen that our exclusivity is the, the sort of creative part or how we present the contents to our audience, no? So, for example, if you give us a certain, we sometimes also legal tech send us like this, like standardized newsletter, probably they send to everybody. And that doesn't tell us anything. Going a little bit back to building like a more personalized relationship, like not just send the same thing to everybody because each media has different interests or each media has different audiences, no? So it's also getting to know the media and, uh, and for us, it's okay. It's we try to put the content in more creative ways or in different formats. Like I told you, no, maybe the the specific written written uh, format for our blog needs to be exclusive in that 
you cannot just put copy paste to the content that you send us and send it to another media, no? Not because you can only publish it with us, but yeah, the, that content, the written content, uh, can't be copy pasted to other media. And also, uh, like I told you, the different formats, we do podcasts, we do this webinar, so, and that's uh, different ways of, of, of doing the same uh, content, no? And I would also like to stress also Vanita's point about the content marketing, no? If me, I am the, I, I subscribe even me to some legal tech newsletters, which I find interesting because I even learn from them, no? I even learn from, because we are like in the media, we, we know a little bit about everything, about all the, the different tools, but we always learn also, no? So if you have an interesting, uh, it, which goes back to my starting point of the educational part of the of the generating content for your audience, for your clients, and even for us media. So you can also, if I find your content interesting, you gain authority even before my eyes. No, so definitely I can tell you that I have uh, invited not because they 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 look for me, but because I sort of start linking everything in the internet and I sort of start receiving content, which I find very interesting. And I can also go in search of somebody, of a legal tech, no? So I definitely think we should use the pull strategies and not the push strategies, no? Which are, which are a characteristic of the content marketing. Um, I, I agree with Alejandra say, okay, or I have a good product or I have a good con uh, marketing, but I can tell you that a good product and a good content strategy is a good marketing strategy without the need of investing a lot. You know? So it's more about saying what strategic um, content I'm going to develop. And I've downloaded eBooks even from different uh, illegal tech uh, uh, websites. No? And another part also is I wanted to add, to add is the part of the website you know? for me whenever they send me a request, whatever, the first thing I do is go to their website to see. Uh, and it helps a lot and not all of the legal texts that I've seen have it. Uh, like a video of, of the, um, of, of, that I can see how the platform looks. No, not a video only of you telling me, oh yeah, I'm the best and, and I solved this, this problem. I understand, I mean, it's, I think, that's why they're called legal tech solutions. If you are not clear on your pitch of what problem you're solving, which not all of them have, but it's like you cannot even go out to a marketing strategy in, in, in the market. No? So that's, I, I assume you know that you're solving a problem. But now I also, I don't want to uh, start a demo with you. I just want to see a video, a three minute video of seeing how your platform looks, the look and feel, no? And, that's me as a media to, to have like a little bit more, a, a greater vision of, of, of your platform, no? So that's, um, and, and I find it, or, or many, or some have called me and said, oh, can I um, um, do an, uh, an agenda, a call with you so I can show you my platform? Well, probably I don't have this time in my agenda to see five or six or seven legal texts a week, no? So, so that doesn't work a lot because uh, that's a way of contacting that I've seen a lot is they contact me and they say, oh, can, can I have a call with you? And it's like, well, no, <laughs> it's why would you have a call with me? What's it all about? What's, I need to have a preview, not just go ahead and just want a, a, call, a, a call with me, no? So, um, so yeah, basically, um, uh, that would be my, and, and I say it's either paid content or meritorial content. So if you don't have meritorial content from a marketing strategy, from you do have probably to invest or, or, or a little bit of, 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 of both. No? Building a relationship also permits you that probably you were sponsored in, a, in an event that you, that you liked and that was uh, important for you. And then you go building a relationship with that media and uh, and you can have a little bit of, of both, no? So that would be my comment. Uh, you've mentioned, uh, Janet, about the paid content, and my next question will uh, will be related with that. What What is your approach to the advertising? 
Janet, could you? Oh. Ah, okay. Um, so that's a little bit of what I was saying. No, I think it's 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 both. Well, we all are finding uh, content. No, so we have certain spaces, or at least in our media, we're not just a blog or a magazine. We have uh, different different uh, platforms. Um, so what we basically have done is there's a bit of this meritorial content, which um, we've launched two initiatives, uh, which is uh, uh, once a year, we do the most uh, disruptive digital lawyers in Mexico initiative, where we um, have a different allies as association, legal hackers, different digital associations, where they put nominees, no? So it's also, we open to ask the community, not only wait for us or my team to go search for the legal text, but also at, open these platforms for the community to be able to nominate this legal text, no? So um, that's a way of saying, okay, if the community recognizes you, if you have meritorial content, probably you can access some uh, free, free content or be able to be part of this edition and we do an interview, et cetera, no? Um, but if, if you don't have like a differentiator, I think it, you definitely will, you have either to pay or to build a story or both. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes I, I do think, like I said, I do think you have to probably, depending on the platform, uh, invest in, 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 in internal marketing or in external, but I think a PR strategy doesn't necessarily, a, a digital PR strategy, is not necessarily about paying, no? Okay, thank you. Richard, what, what is your opinion about this topic? Please, if you could share with us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's an interesting one. I, I think, simply put, this comes from having worked in, on and off in journalism for 20 years, that there has to be a firewall between editorial news features whatever and paid content right you have to label it etc which i do uh sponsored you know artificial lawyer is proud to present this sponsored article etc but i mean the way i see it is is that you can't buy your way into into an editorial relationship you know you can you can help us you know me and the others you don't fill our pockets by doing adverts and sponsored things, etc. But uh, if you don't have a story to tell, if you don't have an interesting product that connects with that particular magazine's project and its particular audience who are interested in certain types of product, it's just not going to work. You know, uh, if you look at the people, uh, you know, who do sponsor, who produce sponsored articles, which I publish in Artificial Lawyer, for example, they're very often people who've built relationships with me. And they're trying to reach my audience because I have a sort of, you might say, more niche audience. It's people who are very interested in AI, natural language processing, automation. So I would say that money, it's not enough. Well, no, it can't because if you go down that road, I mean, of course, of course, it has some sort of unconscious influence. You know, everyone would be lying if they said it didn't. Of course it does. But if you, if you let that take over, you're finished, you know. And equally, you have to be able to kick people in the... Uh, Kind of, I'm not sure if I can say this on a family program. You need to be able to kick people in the bollocks, Even, you know, no matter who they are. You absolutely have to be able to do that. Um, otherwise, you lose yourself. And what's the point? You might as well go home. So it's it's a, it's a tricky one. Where I say it to people who do want to advertise with me, I just simply say, look, this has no impact on what I write about you. But the funny thing is, is that if they, if they're coming to you for advertising, it means they understand your magazine, they understand your audience. So they've probably built a relationship with you. So you've got a kind of news relationship already. And the two, kind of, the two things quite often grow organically together. You know, it's fairly unusual to have someone throwing money at advertising who has no idea about what your publication is about and has completely failed to generate any news content because all of their proposals are boring. You know, the two kind of go together. But, you know, and I'm sure everyone on this panel will say the same thing. You've got to have a clear firewall. You can't let that bleed. Okay, the, the second question for you, Richard. Uh, Janet was talking about that, about the, let's say, the sources of inspiration. 
uh, for the for the articles. What are your sources? I mean, where do you get the subjects <laughs> for uh, for your uh, your articles? Um, well, like I say, it, it's you know, you build relationships with people. Uh, I mean, like, for example, take Kira, for example, is a good example. I mean, I've known Noah since I started over four years ago, and you know, you build relationships with people, and. And actually, this kind of goes back to this exclusive thing. It's like, it's not that I don't want to break stories. I'm, I'm obsessed with breaking stories, probably too much for my health. Um, it's just that if you've got to that point where it's become a press release, you've kind of failed already. That's the point I'm trying to make, is that you should have such a good relationship with that magazine that you're talking on a regular basis and it just comes up in conversation. It's like, oh yeah, we're about to you know do a massive funding round, but we can't announce it yet. If you could just keep quiet about it we'll tell you some more details in a month or so and that will look like an exclusive but it was never a press release it never even yeah. it never even became a press release so it's kind of like that really it just goes back to relationships i mean you know that's it i can't really expand on that okay thank you uh bob could you share with us where are your uh sources of inspiration uh well, I would I would just uh, underscore everything that, that Richard just said. I mean, so much about it is about relationships. Um, one of the uh, something I, I most miss during this uh, time of uh, global pandemic is the ability to go to conferences and, and talk to people because I, I used to uh, find that that was such a rich source of uh, uh, networking and connecting with people and, and hearing about things that I might not otherwise hear about. Uh, so I do miss that. Um, you know, I think uh, for, for all of us, uh, I'm sure that we all uh, hear regularly from a lot of this, the usual suspects who are constantly uh, in, in touch with all of us. So I, we certainly, you know, I have a lot of people just reaching out to me with story ideas all the time. Uh, I do have a lot of people that I network with or that I talk to on a regular basis just to check in with. And then I, I monitor a, a whole lot of uh, uh, news feeds and RSS feeds and other blogs. I mean, I, everybody, uh, you know, on, on this call, I, I, I'm probably following their blogs too. And um, any on other, I have a bunch of like Google alerts set up for, for different kinds of uh uh, items that, that might pop up. So, you know, I'm really kind of monitoring a, a broad spectrum of, uh, of sources. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it does kind of, kind of start with, uh, checking my email in the morning and see, seeing what's new that day and, and going from there. And coming back to the previous question about the page content and advertising, uh, how it is in your case, what is your approach? Well, uh, I, you know, I, I, I probably have the, the, the worst approach of anybody on, on this uh, program about advertising. I, I mean, I, I f certainly the fact that somebody is a paying advertiser is, n is not going to have any bearing on whether I write about them or not. Uh, and and in, in fact, un until fairly recently, I never was at all in any way directly involved in selling advertising on my blog. It was always sold through third parties um, until uh, earlier this year, the, the people at Above the Law, the, the blog Above the Law, uh, were in charge of selling advertising on my blog. So I had no idea who they were selling to, uh, or I mean, I would see what advertising appeared on my blog, but frankly, I didn't even pay a whole lot of attention to it. Uh, and, and they would, so that's both display advertising and they would also sell sponsored posts. Um, so uh, as of the beginning of this year, that relationship has ended and uh, I'm, I'm now just kind of uh, creeping into the world of uh, dealing with sort of directly trying to sell advertising on my blog. Uh, but uh, I'm not a salesperson. I'm an, I'm a writer. And uh, so, uh, you know, I, I don't, I'm not really comfortable with it. I, I don't like, uh, being in the position of, you know, uh, calling, uh, calling a company one day about, uh, do you want to send me some money? And then calling them the next day when I, when I, I hear some bad report about them, uh, and I'm writing a story about it. Um, so I, I really, uh, right now I'm kind of betwixt in between on advertising to tell you the truth. Uh, and I'm trying to find another third party to sell it for me. I don't, I don't want to be in a position of doing that. 
Okay, thank you. Caroline, I've accumulated for you three questions. Uh, one is about uh, paid content and advertising. The second is about sources of, of inspiration. And the third one, uh, what about PR agencies? Your collaboration with the PR agencies? I mean, if the, you know, uh, if uh, the collaboration from the, uh, from the legal tech startup uh, perspective with the PR agency, if it makes um, the chances to be to be published uh, higher or uh, or the contrary? Yeah, sure. Um, so if we deal with the pay the pay for a bit first. Um, so we have a very strict um, no advertorial policy. So we don't we don't post any paid for content. We 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 um, only post. It, it's, it's, it's quite complex, but in terms of the editorial co content, there is no compromise. We don't post any paid for content. Um, we do post ad ad adverts and we have a separate, um, for, I'm, I'm not involved in the advertising side of things, so um, that's dealt with separately. Um, but I would be lying if I didn't say occasionally it causes arguments. <laughs> But we are very strict about it. <laughs> um, we don't. If 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 we have and, and the, our advertisers, we usually have a great relationship with them. They understand that it's not a guarantee of positive press coverage, and that has proved to be the case over the years. But hopefully, they get benefits from our platform. They do. They do get benefits from advertising on our platform. Um, and there's obviously. I mean, it's very difficult to be completely dogmatic about it when you've got a relationship with somebody. Um, to say that it's very hard to say, oh, you know, I'm, there's no benefit categorically. Certainly there's no conscious benefit. We would never, and, and I've written plenty of negative stories about advertising. So, so in as far as it's possible to be dogmatic, I'm dogmatic about this editorial sales divide. I try to be very dogmatic about it, try to be very principled. Um, and, but obviously, you know, when you've got relationships with people, that's as we've already discussed, where you're more likely to get coverage. So it's hard to be completely dogmatic, but we definitely try. Um, and then we've recently, um, just to be completely, like, so it's almost like formal disclosure, so we've now started to do a lot of webinars in the area of COVID, um, and they are paid for content, and then we will write about the webinar. So um, okay. that's that's kind of a form of um, paid. It's, it's how it works. It's how yeah, it works. So, but so, but to be, so that is, that's a paid for, new, no paid for content. Um, and then... Um, and then in terms of, yeah, but it's, it's a complete, you know, can be a nightmare. And, and, and for the full disclosure, so our commercial director is also my husband. And I'd be lying if we didn't have a few shouting matches over that. <laughs> and apparently I always write a really negative story just as someone's going to pay money. <laughs> but so, um, so um, and then in terms of source, uh, what was the second question? So um, you were talking about PR agencies and before that you were talking yes. about... Sources of inspiration. Sources of inspiration. Yes. Um, so like, so yes, so I also prefer conversations. I mean, we get a lot of press releases and it makes my life a hell of a lot easier. And if it's a good press release, we'll, we'll, and, and to be perfectly honest with you at the moment when I'm trying to, as a, as a mother trying to juggle everything, press releases are kind of a bit of a lifesaver. I'm going to be completely frank with you because obviously the pressure on time is, is enormous. Um, so, so press releases are very valuable, but in ter and, and please don't stop sending them. But in terms of, you know, real, the, the stuff I love is where we, like, like Richard was saying, where we have conversations and, you know, and I do that a lot, Bob alluded to, Bob mentioned, sorry, um, conferences. And again, you know, normally I would be having lots of chats in, in person. That's probably where, over a glass of wine, that's probably where you often get your, have your best chats about what's really going on in the business. And so either you hear about a piece of news that, that you know, they, they, they share with you that you then follow up, um, or, um, or it's like more like you start to build up knowledge, real knowledge of, of the business, which so you can then start pulling together trends, you know, perhaps stuff, stuff that's going on with other companies as well. Or, but a lot of it comes from conversations. Um, so, so that for me, you know, and I love, I love breaking stories, much like the, the other people on this, on this call. Um, so if there's, yeah, like I something that, 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 you know, we can, we can break after a conversation, um, so much the better. And sometimes that's, sometimes that's things that people want us to write about. And sometimes it's things that they don't. Um, and so that makes a difficult conversation sometimes. Um, so yeah, so it can be, um, that's for me, the biggest source of inspiration. And then in terms of PR agencies, there's probably lots of PR agencies listening and we've got good relationships with most of them. <laughs> um, 
and um, and they definitely serve a purpose in that they a we know each other, so they can, I can be, for, for many of them they'll send me an email and I'll recognise their name and I'll know that it's a story, so it's worth having a look. Um, I think that, and I think that there's some that are really effective at their job, and they understand that it's about the relationship, and um, you know, and we all go for lunch at Ilta or wherever it is, and we get to know each other, and we'll go for drinks and we'll have fun. And with them, it's a relationship business as well, or they'll pick up the phone or whatever. So, so, um, and and they and they get what makes the story. So sometimes it can help us cut to the chase more quickly because they and they and also a lot of them are good writers, right? So, so they can they can work out how to explain what the story is very quickly, and actually they can write something that makes sense that we can use pretty much sometimes. I don't use a lot of press releases off the shelf as it were, but they, you can sometimes just, if needs be, just pick it up and put it in. You know, they're good writers, so that. Um, but I mean, I think that having said that, I think that there's a risk uh, uh, when you when you're talking about an organisation. I think that there, I would never, I, I would always much rather as a f first port of call have relationships with the managing partner or the sorry or the IT director or the CIO or whatever. And and I don't think that, and and it would annoy me if I get kind of passed off from a PR agency as oh you deal with them to get to me you know that would that would mean that I wouldn't bother right if I don't have a relationship with your key key strategic people then I probably won't bother unless there's a bad story in it. like because I figure if you can't be bothered to invest your time in me why should I be bothered you know it's about that constant you know email conversation being accessible so for me the key people in an organization um be that a law firm or vendor or whatever it might be need to be accessible and we need I need to feel like I can pick up the phone if I've got a question and I don't get fobbed off to say oh you have to go through a third party that I find that's really irritating um, so I think it's about as a balance I think that PR agencies can be very helpful um, in kind of, sort of creating creating content opportunities but don't ever personally think of them as a way to avoid contact or, or is a kind of like hedge because it for me it just doesn't work and if anybody else feels the same <laughs> okay thank you i have an impression that today's webinar is sponsored by relationships uh, because <laughs> uh, i've noticed that almost every uh, everyone is uh, is talking a lot about relationships uh vanita i know that you have pr agency background uh, please, could you uh, share with us uh, your experiences uh, from this another side uh, of the mirror? <laughs> yeah, for sure. So I do have agency um, experience and I've also worked at a previous tech startup where I was managing PR agencies. And I think internally what matters is that you have someone who knows the inner workings of your company, right? Because a PR agency, they're not in contact with you as much as your internal team. They're an extension of your team. And they depend on you to educate them on your products and what's going on. So I feel like if you're a startup, invest internally before you invest externally. Um, so there's that's one key point there and then the other is um, if you're looking to secure more coverage do not go towards the PR agency route um, as a startup I understand resources are limited uh, there's a lot of free resources that you yourself can use to garner coverage, right? But if you do have the capability, invest in that PR person because their sole job isn't to just garner coverage. They're also there to manage your reputation, right? Um, in the end, they have to manage reputation with diverse publics and that's not just media. It's also stakeholders, it's investors, it's your customers. Um, so I feel like that's a misinterpretation of PR and I constantly hear it <laughs> every day. Um, but yeah, that, I think the key advice there is know that the only people who will know your company are those who work internally for you. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is 15 minutes left. 
so I will make the last question, but um, maybe it's uh, some kind some kind outside of our subject today. But as we have uh, in our webinar, so great uh, legal tech personalities. So I uh, can't resist to uh, to make you this uh, this question, and I will start uh, from Alejandro. Uh, now we are living in, a, I would say, in a times of change. And what do you think what it will be, or maybe what it is now, and uh, uh, legal sector, the legal tech sector, uh, after or maybe um, during the COVID-19? Uh, thank you. <clears throat> I think uh, from this perspective, uh, although there's been a lot of suffering in the world, and that's, that's, that's for sure. I think on the other hand, I think the, the new world we live in is uh, better for the legal tech adoption on the one hand. And on the other hand, I think uh, we'll make the professionals, we'll make the lawyers, we'll make us um, have a better life uh, in general so that we are not going to work that much, I hope. Uh, we are not going to spend that many hours in the office. I think we will be capable of uh, working uh, remotely, uh, stay with our families. And uh, that's, that's the whole purpose why I uh, started Big Illegal, to really make a change and to really help um, our colleagues to have a more balanced, uh, life and work situation uh, where until now has been crazy. I think for now everyone has, something has clicked in their mind and I think they are uh, not that, uh, they are thinking why not, why not, we should do something. And I think there is also another approach to this which we, we have been looking into because we started um, we are in a European project and recently the European Union has um, uh, get a lot of attention into the climate change thing. I think also legal tech is here to help in that matter. I think, uh, or most of the people that maybe are hearing uh, this webinar, I would like to ask them if when they had to work remotely, if they didn't have a printer machine, did they have to go uh, running to buy one? Because otherwise, they should really uh, they should really question why the use of uh, paper, because the, the best thing in the first place is not using it. Recycling, it's per se itself, is also consuming uh, resources and polluting. So, I think legal tech also is going to contribute to a better world uh, in that sense. That's very positive, I would say. Janet, what is your opinion? What, is, what will be the future uh, after the COVID-19? Well, I think the future is in one word, which is value. Um, I see like a, like a, a paradox, no? On one side, uh, we have obviously the, the need, as Alejandro said, of, of technology, of processes, of being more efficient. On the other hand, we also have what Caroline said is that many companies don't have this big budget. Many companies stopped investing in, in other things like technology. So um, I think the word value is a future why because it's not that there is no money, but people are really being careful where they invest their money. So if I don't um, see the value, the real value, not what you come and you tell me, um, uh, of, of your solution into my efficiency, I'm not going to invest the money there. So even if this was already a ten tendency, like I say, COVID, it's, it just accelerated tendencies. It didn't change anything in the world. We were all going there, but it just happened in three months, uh, what hadn't happened in 10 years, no? So this was already a tendency. No, the, the thing of, of, of people investing money, obviously it has always been where they see value. So I think um, this part of the pitch, of the, the elevator pitch is very important. If you cannot tell me in two or three minutes what you're gonna solve me, solve 
what problem you're going to solve to me. And that's a thing about lawyers. Lawyers say, oh, I'm dedicated to civil, to capital law, to investment. Okay, but you never told me what problem you're going to help me solve as a company, as a person. So I think we need to change this chip fast into not um, selling services or, 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 um, or softwares. We are selling solutions, whatever we do, solutions centered in the person. No, so I would definitely, I, I, I was part of, of a judging in a legal tech competition yesterday and really it's sometimes they just do five, 10 minute pitches and I didn't even understand what your tool is. No, so as a, as a startup, you really need to have your three minute elevator pitch really, really good because that's what you're gonna write in a message, that's what you're gonna tell your story about, no? So center on what value and what solution you're gonna help me solve. I've seen legal techs that have grown in this pandemic, and I've heard about stories, legal techs that said, we don't have any clients. And I tell them, well, you should analyze the value you're giving to your client, because people should be buying, but only if they find the value. Okay, thank you. Vanita, what is your perspective? Yeah, so from what I've seen, the pandemic has caused conservative mindsets towards technology to shift to one of adaptability, right? And that's because digital transformation has accelerated over the last few months, specifically because of the pandemic. Um, from what we have seen and from interviewing our clients, um, it's because lawyers are now working from home as office closures, social distancing, and stay in place measures have been implemented. That's causing an industry wide adoption of technological tools that are now the epicenter of operating procedures. And what I truly believe is that the pandemic will have once and for all pushed legal organizations to go fully digital and paperless. And legal tech tools that enable efficiency will thrive. Okay, thank you. Caroline? Yeah, so, yeah, so I was just giving thoughts. So I think, yeah, I've got down, we've already seen acceleration towards cloud, um, which was already, you know, for, for whatever that means. <laughs> but so we are seeing, you know, the move to remote working has made people realize, you know, it's made them prioritize um, cloud projects that were already ongoing digitization of their processes. We've seen a big um, uptick in e-signatures. Um, so I hosted a webinar the other day um, looking at, um, speaking to Clifford Chance that, that ran the Global Legal Hackathon. They created a playbook for e-signatures um, because there's a, huge, a lot of hurdles in the way still, but there's a realization that, 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 that these are the technologies available um, and that people should be using it, but there's a lot of hurdles in the way. Um, and um, to think that hopefully um, there'll be more focus on pro efficient processes, because obviously, as we all know, technology is like the icing on the cake. So what 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 they what organisations really need to be doing is now, really, if they weren't before, and, and accelerating this, if, even if they were, is looking at their processes, working out what their workflow is, how to automate that, what they do, how they do it, how to automate what it is they do and make it as efficient as possible. Um, and the issue there, I think that, that COVID can't fix is, is culture. Um, and I think that, um, so I think that we've seen an acceleration of a lot of trends, but the issue that they will have to face up to is the fact that law firm culture in particular is, 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 um, it is not going to be changed by COVID. And, and what's really interesting, final quick point, um, is that there, there, I think with the start of the lockdown, um, there was an elevation of IT in, in status, right? I spoke to quite a number of IT directors who were basking in this newfound respect and adulation. One of them got a round of applause at a partner's meeting on Zoom, you know, and, and suddenly people went, oh, we've got IT, it works, you know. <laughs> um, and, and, they were, and they were really chuffed about this and they seemed to be surprised. And, um, and what's interesting is that I think there's already been a retraction. Retra I've spoken to, I was speaking to a CIO the other day who said actually things are already starting to go back a bit to normal in the sense that they're starting to ask for why, why can't this happen? I want this fixed now, you know. And, and I think that things to really change going forward, for, I think that 
that we need to, so part, a lot of it comes down to the way that the tech teams communicate and I think understanding, I think this goes for startups or IT teams, I really think it's a really important point, is that they need to understand how to communicate properly and really assert themselves as well sometimes. I mean, that's obviously more difficult if you're a vendor, but I think to really start to, 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 to perhaps capitalize on some of the changes that we've seen during COVID and to really start to assert themselves and say, I am the expert and, that, and have that kind of what's, what someone once described to me as a parent to parent rather than a parent to child relationship. Um, that's easier said than done, but I feel like in order to really make change happen going forward, we can't just say, oh, COVID's happened, things are going to change. I think actually there is a real risk with the funding crisis that's going to happen and firms sitting on their money, that, that, that there is a risk that not as much change will happen as we hoped. Although, the last point, that it will be driven by the clients. Fixed fees, etc., more efficiency, all of the stuff that we talk about. There'll be a definite pressure there. But anyway, it's too much to go into. We need another one more. <laughs> <laughs> we will try to organise another one. <laughs> yeah, shut up. Uh, Richard. Could you please share your thoughts? We can't hear you. There you go. No, I just told you another secret, but um, <laughs> but yeah, um, I'll do this quickly. Market fundamentals tend to stay in place for a very long period. Right? It's very rare when something comes along that actually shakes an entire market, not just the legal market or legal tech market, but the entire economy and society. And when market fundamentals are really hit, really shaken, it enables people to float new ideas, to challenge the status quo. And rather than those ideas normally just being like, ha ha ha, that's a silly idea, it'll never happen in a million years. Like, hey, we'll all work from home. Even though we can go back to the office, we'll stay there. You know, people have been talking about that for decades. I mean, you know, decades and decades. And now suddenly people are like, yeah, actually, let's do that. And it was possible in one week, right? Exactly, exactly. And the point is, is that like most things, I mean, you know, there is enough legal technology floating around the world to completely and utterly overnight transform the entire legal market if everybody made use of it, right? But they don't because you have market fundamentals, you have cultural patterns which just keep going keep going keep going so when a crisis comes along like this it's tragic but there are some silver linings in that it opens up people's minds and they're willing to try new things and you kind of like you start off on a new fundamental so i'm, I'm very optimistic and for me personally it's come at a very good time because i've sort of you know got this campaign to try and change the status quo a bit and this can you know it's perfect you know it's uh people are really, really questioning the way things are. Thank you. Uh, Bob, please go ahead. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, Kala, early at the beginning of this uh, program, I, I think it was you who talked about the fact that there are some differences in the legal technology industry in different parts of the world and different countries. Uh, but I think the one thing I've seen, the one commonality uh, in pretty much every country that I've visited is that the legal system has done a really poor job of serving uh, those who are, are not of great means financially, the, 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 the poor, low income, middle income people. Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, I agree with what everybody so far has said here in terms of the fact that I think this situation uh, is already accelerating uh, the recognition of the importance of legal technology and the adoption of legal technology. Uh, but I think the other thing it's done is really laid bare or exposed the, the, the fundamental shortcomings in, in the way we deliver legal services and the way we deliver justice. Uh, you know, I mean, here in the United States, the courts have been brought to a standstill uh, by this pandemic, uh, and and uh, they they've recovered and, and they've dug out, uh, but the courts were not equipped to deal with any kind of a situation like this. And I think uh, many law firms, many legal providers, were just not equipped to deal with this kind of a situation. So, you know, uh, I mean, Richard talks about change. I, I I think, you know, for a long time there have been. You know, there have been those of us in the legal world who who get it, who understand the role of technology in uh, enhancing the ability to deliver legal services. And there have been 
the holdouts, the, 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 the legal professionals who have been fighting uh, to some extent the adoption of technology, who've seen this as a threat to their, their way of being, to their way of doing business. Um, and, I, and I think that for those holdouts, for the, those who've resisted change, I think they have now seen just how flawed the old way of doing things really is and how important it is uh, that we change uh, those ways of doing things. You know, I, I think here in the United States, we are gonna quickly see some major reforms in, in the regulations around how, how legal services are delivered and, and who can own legal services and invest in legal services. So, you know, I, th I think this is a, uh, not just an acceleration, I, th I think this is a real turning point uh, that's, that is gonna uh, uh, fundamentally change uh, for the benefit of, of clients of all kind, whether they're wealthy clients or poor clients, I think everybody is going to end up being better served by the legal system as a result of this. Uh, you, you were talking about the access to justice. And now I realized that I think that it was the last conference that took place in Poland. It was uh, about, it was the legal conference and uh, the organizers invited Richard Suskind with his latest book, uh, Remote Courts. And I, I didn't know if it was, um, uh, I think that it is significant that uh, you, are, you are talking right now about the access to justice and his latest book uh, is exactly about, uh, about, uh, about that. And I think that um, somehow that's the, uh, that's the sign. Uh, we uh, we have finished. Uh, we, we don't have uh, more time. So uh, many 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 thanks to uh, to you to to all the speakers, uh, to all the attendees. Uh, I would I also like to to thanks to uh, Julia and to Holger from uh, from Elta, uh, who helped organizing this on uh, this webinar. And uh, I hope that uh, we will meet uh, maybe during the conference uh, and that uh, building relationships, uh, uh, what is so important, as, uh, as we said, will be, um, will be possible in offline world, let's say. Thank you. Yeah, well done. Thank you, Camilla. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.